Welcome, my Garage Army. So this is Garage Geek. Welcome to Friday Night Chats. Um, I've got just a little bit for you, but I'm sure I'll make it last 30 minutes because you know how I like the gab, gab, gab. So it's Friday night, and this is the last Friday before I go back to work. I have nothing to complain about. My beard is all lopsided. I have nothing to complain about because I had a summer off well, most of you poor schleps out there were working, grinding away, day in and day out, with just two me measly days off a week. I have nothing to complain about. That doesn't mean I want to go back to work, though. No. I don't want to go back. I don't want to, I don't want to, I don't want to. At least, at least, I'm going to be doing something fun tomorrow, and maybe on Monday. So, let's talk about Monday. Uh, the Cabazon Dinosaurs which if you don't know what those are which probably you know many of you don't so there's these two giant dinosaurs that this garage station uh put up i don't even know when probably in the 40s or 50s as a you know roadside attraction so people will stop and buy their gas they're so famous now recently they've been doing uh paint jobs on them to get tourists to come and the most recent paint job they did was a f in honor of Pee Wee uh, Herman's passing. Now, I haven't looked at the online photos yet, but I would like to drive there. It's about an hour and a half. It's about 30 minutes away from Palm Springs, but Palm Springs is deadly hot right now. So I'd like to go visit the dinosaurs, go to Palm Springs for lunch. Seriously, my husband and I went to Palm Springs last year in the summer, and it was crazy. We almost had heat exhaustion. Like, we went into a museum and it was a beautiful museum to get out of the heat and we were both like suffering from heat stroke it was crazy so i don't even know like my, the first thing i said to my, my husband he was like uh it, it's gonna be too hot and i was like ah let's just go like i don't learn from my mistakes <laughs> so what would i do tomorrow where's my little oh i have the advertisement hold on i'm gonna get it for you my dog's at my feet. He's bothering me. He wants to jump up. He can't make up his mind. So tomorrow is finally the Comics and Cocktails event. And I'm so looking forward to meeting two of my favorite YouTubers. They said they're going to meet me there. Sleepy, Sleepy Reader 666 and Larry's Library. Thank you so much, guys. I look forward to seeing you uh, tomorrow at this event. Um... So, let's move on. I really, really don't have a lot to talk about. So, um, let me let me go to the like the the small things and and work my way up. I want to talk about the cramps again. So, come on, jump. So, oh god, you need kisses right now. Um, you threw me off. I don't know now. I don't know what I'm saying, and this is kind of live. <laughs> I vinyl Richie turned me onto the cramps. And I listened to their album. I really liked it. He told me about a concert venue in um, an insane asylum or a mental institute. Sorry. And I watched it. It's really good. And then I guess because I was watching the cramp stuff, a concert came up in my feed. And I, I'm going to have to show this in the video. Because the lead singer of the cramps, he's wearing these pants that are so low and... He's super skinny, right? I mean, he's got a nice body. He pulls it off. But what he does with the microphone is very lewd and what, those pants. And one of the comments someone wrote at the bottom, I have so much anxiety about his pants right now. And when I read that, it just encapsulated the video. It's hysterical. But if, I wish I knew the name. I, I, I wanna cover this in a video actually, to put a clip and then put the link to it. But if you know the concert I'm talking about, or maybe you can, scroll through and you'll see that comment I, I think they pin it as the top one um great video though wow is that guy a performer and the funniest thing there's a female guitar player and she's just nonchalantly strumming the car she looks over at him a few times in disdain and just keeps playing like Ugh, how'd i get saddled with this guy and she just keeps playing it's really funny all right, I lost my place and uh, with my list. Thank you, Angel. Do you want to come back up? Hurry up. No? All right. Uh, I'm going to talk about 
some things that I've been listening to. And um, I so No Solution made a response video um, and I actually went ahead and watched his one of his earliest videos and he made a whole bunch of recommendations and since he made the video for me, I went ahead and made a playlist of all the music in the video and I've been listening to it the last three days, but it's a lot of music. There's a lot of Merlion. It's like so much Merlion and I'm like, but I'm listening to it and I'm, I'm quite enjoying it. Um, but like I said, it's a lot. And then This Is Music made me a response video today and there's a lot of music in that. So what I hope to do is since it's a response to me that I eventually will watch that video again and make a playlist and listen to the, the music in that. I'm just going through This Is Music right now. But in between or in addition to that, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, I'm going to show you some of the CDs I've been listening to. So I had this on rotation. So this is Tim Buckley's first two albums, uh, self-titled Tim Buckley. And then this one is called Goodbye and Hello. I like uh, this series because they have the record covers for both inside. So um, the art and everything is nice on this. Now I'm going to say that I struggle with this one. I like it a lot. I always have, but I don't love it. There are some songs on here that I, I really don't like, but there are others that I really love. So um, I know he's highly, highly regarded, but this is like hit and miss for me. If any of you uh, out there know this, uh, please chime in on what you think. Um, yeah, because no matter how many times I play this, like I, I, I play this and then I put it away for a few years and then I, I bring it out and I play it again and my attitude doesn't change. Uh, this one is going to make me unpopular. I, I really don't care about popularity. Come on. It's music is music. And, um, I like what I like. I'm, I'm just so sorry. So this is Manilo sings Sinatra. And I put this on, uh, I, I put this on and I was thinking, okay, well, this is Barry Manilow. He's an older singer at this point. He's covering one of the most well-known singers. There's no way he's going to sound as good wrong he sounds amazing on this this is actually really good i was very surprised at how good this is i played this one over and over and i did not get tired of it it is a great album uh 16 most requested songs meltem right now i have torme i have a collection of these and i like um listening to these uh once in a while uh, rotating through them um this guy really like if you close your eyes he sounds like a modern singer and i'm not sure which one like michael buble or some something like that one of those modern singers but wow does he sound smooth he he's a really good singer this is actually a really good cd <clears throat> sorry i'm gonna keep clearing my throat i don't have my coffee with me tonight I actually made a, a short video about this one, Mabel John. This is called Stay Out of the Kitchen. Now, I talked about the story in that video, so I won't go through it. Um, but there's only like five or six songs on this whole CD that were ever published uh, until this, which is quite interesting. Um, I really like it. I the, the song that I featured in the video is my favorite, and that is Abel Mabel. And that is one of the... Um, unissued tracks, strangely enough. Um, it's a very sexual song. She's talking about how able she is. She's able, Mabel. That's, I mean, it's a great song. Give it a spin. Here's another one that people are going to be like, ugh, okay. I love Art Garfunkel. I don't care what you have to say. Love him. And I, what I, I mean, I really like him, okay? But I put this on and I wanted to listen to it critically. And it blew me away. He, this was from 2007. And what he does is something very unique. He takes standards and he totally reworks them. They're, sometimes they're almost unrecognizable. He totally changes the rhythm, the phrasing, and he does it beautifully. Now, right off the bat, most people don't like standards. I feel so sorry for you, okay? I almost want to cry for you, but that's your life. Go and live it. 
I love the American Songbook, and I love what Art Garfunkel Funkel does with it on this CD. I give this five out of five. So run out and get it. <laughs> All right. And then uh, I pulled this one out again and listened to it. This is, you know, I'm sure everybody knows this one, Rising Stand. Uh, Raising Sand? Uh, Raising Sand. Uh, collaboration between Robert Plant and Alison Krauss. Um, if you don't know this, you're doing yourself a disservice. This album won multiple Grammys for a reason. And I really, really wish that I was still doing challenges with um, Guz 69 and This Is Music, uh, Kim, at This Is Music, uh, Gustavo and Kim. Um, I would like to challenge um, one or both of you to listen to this. This recording is so beautiful. And by the time you get to the end, the last song, which is called Your Long J Journey, is sublime. This thing is beautiful. Um, so many standout tracks. Uh, Killing the Blues, Polly Come Home, Gone, 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 Please Read the Letter. I mean, I could just keep going on and on. This is a real masterpiece. So, Guz69, if you're watching. Kim, this is music. If you're watching, challenge me. Give me one of your death metal albums. I'll happily listen to it if you want to do one of these challenges. I haven't done a challenge in so long that this would be, this would be a really good one to do it with. And uh, Kim or uh, Gustavo, if you already know this, let me know in the comments what you think, please. Uh, okay, books. <coughs> oh. So this week, uh, I read, well, I, I think I already reviewed this one, right? And so then I immediately went on to this. And this one is called Stow Away to Mars. I finished that one, and I just started this one. Now, I, I'm one of those people. I bought these for the cover art. I have five of these editions so far. And, um... Science fiction classic, beautiful cover art, gotta buy it. I mean, that's the kind of crazy uh, consumer I am. I shouldn't be GG, I should be CC. Um, so, this one, I was highly regarded. I, Garage Geek, I have to say I'm Garage Geek. Garage Geek loved this book, although I would understand why a lot of people wouldn't. This one, on the other hand, uh, I'm gonna have to say no. Now this one was written in the 60s. And this one was written in the 30s. And you could tell, this was like the beginning of his career. This is John Wyndham, by the way. Um, and while it's a really interesting and fascinating book, it is a book of its time. He ac actually wrote it under um, a pen name. He didn't, he didn't release it under his own. It's very pulpy. Um, it's very sexist. Although, the sexism in this book is kind of interesting. Come on up. Come on. You want to come up? Oi. Okay, I guess you don't want to come up. <laughs> All right. So, the sexism in this book... <laughs> okay. I think he wants to go outside. You're not going outside till this video's done. Sorry. So, the sexism in this book is... It, it crops up a couple of times... And then there's this one whole chapter. It's like devoted to like what women are good for and how they're not as good as men. But at the very end of it, they ask this character. She's the stowaway of the of the book, and it's uh, the stowaway is a female. And so they ask her what she thinks, and she basically says that's trash. And it's interesting because it seems like the author was catering to a male audience but also showing a male audience what he really thinks of all that so i'm wondering about that and another thing about this book is um it's based on the okay angel can you stop thank you i'm never gonna get through this the whole beginning of the book is about this swashbuckler kind of like a john carter warlord or mars figure is like buck rogers where you got this male lead who's who's like adventurous, you know, doing all these things. And then when we get this character, it shifts. She becomes the lead. So she actually is a f almost a female lead in this adventure story. And I think that was very bold 
of this author to do kind of subverted the um the feminist idea so whereas this book is really really uh bad when it comes to its treatment of women in other ways it's kind of ahead of its time i think um anyways fun book pulp book it's nowhere near as serious as the first one that i showed you am i glad i read it yes am i glad i own it yes i mean look at that cover um so i you know it's it's good if i'm i'm doing an author study basically so it's good for me to see his evolution and this is the beginning of his career and the other book was uh later in his career uh and those are the ones that are highly regarded as classics uh, i'm probably going to do uh a, a short on this one if i get around to it all right so those were the books that i read i keep losing my place angel why you keep doing that to me huh he's in my lap right now okay sorry everybody so we're gonna leave the controversies till the end i actually have three things to talk about so i'm kind of excited about that <clears throat> so we're gonna talk about the two shows and one movie that i watched Ooh, i didn't get a picture of the movie sorry everybody um but it's just mission impossible too just imagine tom cruise and there you have it so i might as well talk about that one okay so i watched mission impossible one i thought it was pretty good right i had seen it you know obviously i've seen it before i saw mission impossible 2 when it first came out and i remember you know liking it but not being overwhelmed by it i believe it was directed by john woo and yes there were all the flying pigeons all the like swirling around on bikes all of that um it's like a ballet of violence type of thing it's all there this movie i remember everyone joking about it being about tom cruise's hair all of that's there um this movie does suffer because of that it, it's definitely not the strongest in this franchise it's probably the weakest in this in the franchise um the one saving grace that it has is it has a fanny newton wow she's so pretty she's she's great in the role um so eh, yeah mission impossible 2 i would i would say two and a half to three stars definitely skippable skippable mission impossible and the thing is that i already know that this series goes on to absolute greatness so i'm just watching them in order um but that was the only one i got to this week i finished a uh, secret invasion on disney which is the marvel show and i reviewed it before when i was halfway through saying i thought it was just eh um kind of boring and i ended it with going eh it was just a little bit better but in my opinion marvel shows like that's got to be one of the worst it's bad um yeah, I don't know what to say. It was it was just it, it wasn't worth watching. I mean, it is if you're a fan and you want to, you know, keep up with the Marvel lore and all that stuff. Uh, but otherwise, it's a very skippable show. However, there's a there's a show on I believe it's Apple TV called Invasion. And I had started watching that show and I went ahead and finished it last night. I believe there are 9 or 10 episodes. Um, this one is very character driven and I don't mind that if it's done well it's got a disparate group of characters you you um, you're interested in them uh, it takes place in different parts of the world uh, yeah it involves like you know an international cast you start to like the characters and, and become involved with them they they give you a hint of the aliens the last like couple of episodes there there are a lot more so it's basically an on the road kind of trying to survive uh an apocalypse type show uh but then like i said the last two episodes you get a lot more uh of alien interactions and it ends in such a way that i would definitely be interested in seeing season two and i believe that it's going to be released in near the end of august so i finished it right in time um would i recommend this show for everyone no because it's too slow for most people uh most people wouldn't have the tolerance for it i mean it's a show about aliens and you you don't even really see aliens until like the sixth or seventh episode you get a hint of them early um yeah it's basically uh like i said an apocalyptic on the road type show 
that's done very well. Character driven. And it was interesting that um, both shows had invasion in the title. Con uh, what did controversy? No, not controversy. Uh, coincidence. Okay, so I have three. Ah, it's 20 minutes. Okay, I've got three controversies to go over with you. Fun stuff, fun stuff. All right. <coughs> the first one has to do with the comic book community. Yay. So I, I, I'm going to be vague on the details, right? Because I didn't write any details down. But basically, you can hire artists now uh, to put out what's called a variant cover. And you can, every company that does it, does it differently. So Marvel different, does it differently than DC does it differently from Image. Now, for example, Image, you talk directly with the artists or the, the people who made the comic. Marvel or DC, I think you deal with the, the company. Um, I didn't get into all that. But basically, Gabriela Del Otto is a very famous, well-known comic book artist. And his art is, art is beautiful. I have um, at least five comics with his artwork on it, and they're great. So an independent person from a comic shop paid Gabriela D'Olto for an art piece that would go on his variant cover. And then he displayed the cover and he was putting them, I think, in grab bags and people were bidding on them. And then, you know, it was, you know, supposedly driving the price up because it was an original piece of art, a beautiful piece of art. And it was the whole point. He was investing in this, to, you know, to build his shop and his channel. Well, I guess there was this huge backlash because it wasn't an original piece of art. It, the art was actually used in Europe on a trading card, which I actually really like those trading cards. But the, the, there was a lack of communication or a lack of understanding on all sides because the person who bought the art never even thought to ask, is this an original piece of art? Because that's what variant covers are. They're original pieces of art. He wouldn't think to ask that. And then the people who sell the art, they think, well, it's for a different audience, a different medium, and it doesn't really count. It was a trading card in Europe versus a comic store in the United States. But the thing is, they didn't sell an original piece of art. They, they sold a used piece of art. And there was a huge controversy because of this, you know, this guy basically sold a product that, how would you say, misrepresented the product he was selling. He didn't do it intentionally. But imagine, you know, he's invested all this money in it and all this time. And then, you know, people aren't going to be happy with that. They, they, I'm sure you see what I'm saying. So it, it was unfortunate, but that's kind of a like this weird loophole in this whole variant covers thing. And that actually brings me to the idea of variant covers. There's too many. Every comic can sometimes, and I'm not joking you, there can be 40 or 50 variant covers for one issue. That's, that's staggeringly impossible to collect. And I don't know why the comic book community is putting up with this. Two, there should be two covers. There should be one main cover and one variant cover. And that should be it. And use those other ones for other issues. It's just like, I'm, I don't know. Some people probably wouldn't agree with that. But it's just really driving the comic market like into the stratosphere. Like you can like like this person. He has a comic book cover that basically nobody can own except a select few. And it I don't know. I don't think they should put those as variant covers. They should they should find a new way to deal with that. Like some kind of just variant art or something. I don't know. To me, it's just, it's it's making the comic book market crazy, insane. And But I would say that because I'm not a person who wants to spend a lot of money on on um, comic books. Even though I really, really support the hobby. Um, there was a video put out by Jason Aldean, country singer. 
And the song is called Try That in a Small Town. And I guess the, the ladies on The View went ballistic, calling it racist. And it created this huge controversy because Jason Aldean is suing them. Um, the song, if you listen to the lyrics, the song is very in your face. It's one of those confrontational songs. Uh, they show images in the video of crime and I think they made a mistake. I think they included an image of a crime being or happening at a Black Lives Matter rally or just footage of a Black Lives Matter rally. And that's what set everybody off because um, now they're saying that the lyrics are specifically racist toward black people. Like, we don't want your uh, you black people in our town. We want you... Um, don't even come to our town and try that because you know what will happen. Like, and it's just bringing up all these feelings of, you know, the bad history that has happened in um, my country. So it's a very interesting topic. If you go ahead and listen to the words, there's nothing racist about it. But there's this undertone. And there's this undertone, like if... If anybody said to you, come and try to do that where I live or in my town, I mean, there's definitely an undertone of violence and I would also say racism. But is this song, can you label this song racist? I don't think you can. Um, but it's if you've been following this controversy, it's, it's, it's pretty interesting. Um, if you know about this, uh, please, you know, chime in in the comments. I'd be interested to know where you fall on that and the last thing that i'm gonna um going to close with is uh one of my favorite singers Sinead o'connor died uh i've been listening to her music throughout the week um i absolutely love her saw her in concert so many times she she i've said it many times my number one favorite female singing artist my my male uh my male my favorite male uh, artist is going to be Chris Isaac. Uh, those are my favorites. Um, but she died, unfortunately. Uh, there's a lot of kind of mystique around her death, what happened. She does have a history of mental illness. Um, but the controversy is that Morrissey came out and he gave his opinions on the media. And he slammed the media saying, oh, you're all calling her your darling right now how she was a feminist icon and how she was a trailblazer. But where were you when she was alive and when she needed you? And it's a very powerful statement because Sinead O'Connor, and I'm going to swear, they treated her like shit, especially Americans. And, ooh, I'm starting to get riled up. I need to calm down. <laughs> I love Sinead so much. I'm so sorry. I loved her so much. She had problems. She did. And she suffered for her art. Um, anyways, thank you, Morrissey. I love what you had to say. Um, it's very controversial because he's basically saying the media is worthless. And they just jump on the next bandwagon. They treated um, her horribly throughout her entire career. They dismissed her. Uh, where was the publicity when she needed an, another album? Um promoted when she needed sales right and so um i actually applaud morrissey and i i'm still i mean Sinead o'connor i didn't know her right but it's this weird thing where you develop a relationship with someone that you consider an icon and it's not exactly loss but you have developed this not personal feelings but you develop this sense you know with with an artist and then you know when they die you feel you feel for it, it it's it's just okay I'm, I'm rambling um so i want i just want to say thank you morrissey um i really appreciate your comments i know morrissey's gonna be watching this right um it needed to be said i'm sure you're not the first one to say it but you're absolutely right um i feel shame when i remember i was around for this what americans did to her and how they celebrated um, ew, I don't even like to say his name. That stupid, can't touch this, MC Hammer. Jesus, I had no respect for him sending her tickets. And then 
I've mentioned this before. I absolutely love Joe Pesci. But when he said that Sinead O'Connor needed a slap, and he said that live on Saturday Night Live, catering to all those, oh, those ultra male, just religious, nasty, I lost so much respect for him. And actually, like I said, I really like Joe Pesci. I love his movies. I love what he did with his career. But man, I hope he repented that sometime. If anybody knows that, he needed to because he was wrong. And then what happened later, she was absolutely right with what was going on. Um, so shame on you, Joe Pesci. <laughs> Joe Pesci. Um, did I get his name right? There was an, another guy named Joe Pesci, right? I don't know. I'm kind of riled up. You know who I mean. Uh, the actor in Goodfellas and um, uh, My Cousin Vinny. I love My Cousin Vinny. I love his co-star even more. She's amazing. So I just... Uh-oh, I'm going on too long about Sinead. I, I think her death kind of affected me more than I would like to let on. Um, but anyways... Uh, I'm going to stop there. I went over 30 minutes. I was, I never thought I'd get to 20 with this video. So there you go. It was Angel's fault. He's at my feet right now because he jumped up and he threw me off. <laughs> so I want to thank everyone for the support. Your comments are absolutely welcome. And um, I'll see you again next week after I've had a week of work. <laughs>